So if you have your Bible, again, turn with me to Psalm 117. Once you find your place in Psalm 117, please pray with me. Father, I am amazed that you would use me. That, that you would take me and make me a mouthpiece of your word. That you would bring me here this morning to be gathered with these people to preach this word, to exalt your name. And Father, I'm so thankful for it, but you know how weak I am. You know how desperately in need of you I am. And so Father, I ask that you would fill me with your spirit this morning. That you would shut my mouth and help me only to speak your word. Father, if there is any sin that, that is either known to me or unknown to me in my life, I pray that you would get that out of the way, that I might be pure and clean before you. Father, would you accept this time as my worship to you? As my giving back of the gift that you have given me? Father, I ask that you would be with me and be with this people as we go now to your word. And we pray this in the strong name of Christ. Amen. Amen. Psalm 117. Praise the Lord, all nations. Laud him, all peoples. For his loving kindness is great toward us. And the truth of the Lord is everlasting. Praise the Lord. As we look at our text this morning, no doubt we see that it is a very short text. In fact, it is the shortest of all the Psalms. Not only is Psalm 117 the shortest of all the Psalms, it is the shortest of all chapters in the Bible. Not only is it the shortest of all chapters in the Bible, but it is the exact center point of all Scripture. Psalm 117 is the 595th chapter. There are 594 prior to it, 594 following it. This is not by chance. This is not by coincidence. This is not by mistake. That God would so orchestrate and ordain that Psalm 117 would be, as it were, at the very heart of the Bible. This short psalm sums up for us what the Christian life is. The most necessary mark of the redeemed. The most necessary means by which we can look at ourselves and examine ourselves to see whether or not we are in Christ is found here in Psalm 117. So what is it? The most necessary mark of the redeemed is worship. Worship. Whom do you worship? Do you worship the Lord God? Do you worship the one true and living God of the Bible? Or are you worshiping some false God? Because that's all that exists. The one true and living God and false gods. And so as we look at this text this morning... I want us to be reminded of 2 Corinthians 13 and 2 Peter chapter 1, which both call us to examine ourselves. I want Psalm 117 to be a lens through which we examine our own hearts to say, am I worshiping God as I ought? Am I giving Him praise? Am I giving Him thanks in the way that I ought to give Him praise and thanks? And again, not only one day, but every day. Is this the rhythm of my heartbeat? Is this the anthem of my life? Is it the banner that is over all that I do and think and say? Let God be worshipped. Is that my heart's desire? And as we look at this, we're helped by finding two points. And the psalmist arranges this, that in verse 1, he should give us the extent of the call. The extent of the call. And then in verse 2, he gives us the reason that he gives us the call. By giving us the excellencies of God's character. So first, in point one, he says, praise the Lord, all nations. Note that there are two clauses in verse one. First, praise the Lord, all nations. And second, praise or laud him, all peoples. So he begins here with this larger scale. He begins with, with making sure that he does not leave anyone out of this call to worship God. Praise the Lord, all nations. He begins with what I see to be public worship. Public worship. We see that he uses this word nations. In the Greek, this word is goyim. It could literally be translated Gentiles or others or outsiders. And so what the psalmist is doing here is saying, praise the same God that we praise. 
We should go into the hedges and the highways and say to the people who are outside of the church, praise the same God that we praise. All the other gods are false. All the other idols are vain. The only one true and living God is the God of the Bible. And so then we ought to call people to praise him and him alone. Yes. And he uses this word nations to make sure that every corner of the world is touched. Make no mistake about it. There is only one audience of our praise. Only one who is worthy of our worship. Only one who is deserving of our thanksgiving. And that is the Lord Jesus Christ. All idolaters are, are called here to turn away from their false gods. All, uh, all the Buddhists are called to turn away from Buddha. The evolutionists are called to cease from their man-made ideas. The sexual revolutionists are called to leave their self-worship. The Muslims are called to leave Allah behind in the dust and to worship this one true and living God, the God of the Bible. All people at all time in all places are called to worship this one true God. And if you are here this morning, you are called to worship this one true God. And if you are not, then you are worshiping something that is not worth your time. Stop wasting your time. Stop wasting your breath. No other object of our worship will suffice. No lesser so-called God is deserving of a moment of our time, an ounce of our energy, a dime of our money, or a breath of our praise. God and God alone, beloved, is worthy of our worship. Turn with me back. Perhaps just a page or so in your Bible to Psalm 115. Psalm 115. I want to read verses 1 through 11. Not to us, O Lord, not to us, but to your name give glory. Because of your loving kindness, because of your truth. Why should the nations say, where now is their God? But our God is in the heavens. He does whatever he pleases. Their idols are silver and gold, the work of man's hands. They have mouths, but they cannot speak. They have eyes, but they cannot see. They have ears, but they cannot hear. They have noses, but they cannot smell. They have hands, but they cannot feel. They have feet, but they cannot walk. They cannot make a sound with their throat. Those who make them will become like them. Everyone who trusts in them. O Israel, O Rakes Hill Baptist Church, trust in the Lord. He is their help and their shield. O house of Aaron, trust in the Lord. He is their help and their shield. You who fear the Lord, you who are already saved, continue to fear the Lord. Continue to trust in the Lord. He is their help and shield. Note that the psalmist in 115 makes a mockery of idols. He says, look at them. They've been crafted by man. They've been made by man. And then man has turned around and worshipped them. We worship the things of the world. And if we do that, if we worship the vain things of this world, the useless things of this world, then according to Psalm 115 verse 8, so will our worship be useless. To praise that which is useless is useless itself. No other idol, no other God that is made by man could possibly bend its ear to your need of prayer. Nothing and no one but God has the power to answer the prayer that you have. No one and nothing but God has the power to bring you out of the pit of hell. No one and nothing has the power but God to give you the mercy and the grace and the love and the peace that you need to make it through this life. Stop trusting in idols and instead going back to Psalm 117 verse 1 praise the Lord yeah, yeah. praise the Lord note that we are not simply called to be worshipers we're not merely called to, to worship in the abstract we are not merely called to worship anything and any, everything that we so choose to worship we are called to worship one the Lord Yahweh the creator of all things the giver of all things, the sustainer of all things, the God of all nations. This God and this God alone are we to worship. If you were here this morning 
And you know deep within your heart that you just come to church and play church. That you come here because your ancestors came here. You, came, you come here because your family's here. That you sing the songs just because everyone said flip to the page. That you opened your Bible this morning just because there was a Bible sitting in front of you. But that you do not know God in your heart. That you do not love him with all of your being. That you do not worship him. That you do not have a song of praise to sing to him. I would plead with you. I would beg with beg of you that you turn from your sins. Turn from them. Repent of them. What must we do to be saved? Repent and believe on the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. And he will give you life. Amen. So we see here in verse 1 this public worship. And there are two things that we need to be very careful that we do not assume public worship means for us. First, it is not a means of salvation. Public worship is not a means of salvation. We should be very careful not to assume that the worship of God is the means by which we are saved by God. It is not. We are not saved by worshiping God. We are not saved by serving God. We are saved by God to worship God. We are saved by God to serve God. And so then we are not saved because of what we do. We are not saved because of what we say. We are not saved because of who we know or, or how long we've attended church or if our, church, if our name is on a church membership roll. We are saved by the sovereign and loving grace of the Lord Jesus Christ yeah, yeah. poured out upon Calvary. I'm reminded of Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 and 9. It says, For by grace, by grace, by unmerited favor, by the love of God, for by grace you have been saved through faith, through believing in Him, through trusting in Him, through casting your soul upon Him. And that, not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. Not as a result of works, so that no one may boast. Beloved, if we were saved by how long we were on the church membership roll, then we would have divisions popping up within the church. Because one would say, well, I've been on the church membership role longer than you have, you have. Therefore, I must be more saved than you. That's not, that's not how salvation works. We are all saved by the same grace of the same God. And so then we are not saved by worship. We are saved to worship. We are saved by God's grace to then give him as grateful receivers of his grace the praise and the worship that he is due. This call to worship is not a call to act in such a way as to assume that if we are good enough that God would look upon us. If our worship is about getting God's attention, then we have a wrong idea of worship. Worship is not about getting God's attention. It is about giving God our attention. It is about giving God our praise. It is about him being our audience of worship. Of us saying, verse 1 of Psalm 117, praise the Lord, not praise me. It's not about me. It's not about us. It's about the Lord. It's about lifting up His name, exalting His name, and being glad in who He is and in what He has done. Are you glad in the Lord? Yes. Are you thankful for His work in your life? Some may say that if I can worship Him well enough that he will look upon me and save me. No. No. He has saved you so that you would worship him. You don't worship him so that he would save you. It is not a means of salvation. Secondly, public worship, the gathering together of the church of Jesus Christ for the purpose of praising him is not a means of self-glorification. It is not a means of making us look good to others. It is not to make us look like grade A Christians and everyone else like grade B Christians because they missed Wednesday evening service and we were there. Worship of the Lord is all about him. It's all about Jesus. It's all about centering our heart, our mind upon him. I'm reminded of Matthew chapter 5 verses 13 through 16 in which he calls us to be salt and light. And at the end of that, after he calls us to good works, he says, so that, so that, do all of your good works, all of your good deeds that you would do in front of others and before God, do them all so that, for this purpose, 
for this means so that they would give glory to your Father who is in heaven. It is all about God. And the moment that it becomes about you, it becomes idolatry. The moment that your worship becomes about, am I singing this the right way? The moment that your worship becomes about how many people listen to my sermon on YouTube or on Facebook, the moment that it comes about that, the very moment it comes about that, it becomes idolatrous. It is all about God. It is all about Him. Amen. Second, in the second clause of verse 1, He says, laud Him, or praise Him, or exalt Him, or honor Him, all peoples. Yeah. It doesn't take a scholar to know that a nation is made up of people. And so in the first clause, He's speaking to nations. He's speaking on a larger scale. In the second clause, He's speaking smaller. He's speaking closer to home. He's making sure that now he's, he's, he's covered everyone with a blanket statement, praise him all people, but now he wants to speak to you directly. He wants to speak to me directly and say exalt him, praise him, worship him. The audience is smaller and the word used to express the worship of that audience deals more with the soul than with the speech. It deals more with the inward exaltation than the outward expression. How is your heart this morning? What is your mind thinking about this morning? Is your mind troubled with the worries of this world? Is your mind thinking more about what's going on outside of the church than what's going on in the church? Is your heart based on corrupt things? Is it rooted in corruption? We're told in Jeremiah 17, 9 that the heart is desperately sick and wicked. All it thinks about is evil. Is that your heart this morning or has God changed you? Has God done a work in you to make you thankful to him? Wayne Grudem in his book, Systematic Theology, would define worship in this way. Worship is the activity of glorifying God in his presence with our voices and our hearts. Worship is not only about what we do on Sunday morning. Worship is not a song. Worship is the disposition of the heart that is bent toward God and says, look at what God has done. In 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 31, we're told whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do it all to the glory of God. Yes. Amen. Absolutely everything, even down to the most basic, the most fundamental, the most mundane of all human tasks, eating and drinking. We are called even in that to glorify God. Not only when we gather here, not only when we gather with whatever church we may gather with, not only when we feel like it, but at all times and in all places, all people are called to glorify this one true and living God, the God of the Bible, the one who has given you breath, the one who sustains and keeps you alive even now as you are sitting here this morning and you have blood pumping through your body. Your heart is beating. Your mind is thinking. Neurons are shooting back and forth throughout your whole body to make sure that you are able to move your hands and move your feet. All of that is because of God. For sure. That is the God who we are called to worship this morning. We worship a big God. We worship a true God. We worship a living God. In contrast to all other gods who are dead and do not exist, our God is in the heavens and he does whatever he pleases. And he is pleased to bring himself glory. He is worthy of your praise. And even when you don't think he is, even when your soul is dismayed by the burdens of this world, when your mind is struck with the anxieties of life, and when your heart is troubled with feelings of hopelessness that inevitably come upon all of us, he is still worthy of your praise. Yes, he is. Billy Graham, when speaking of, in a devotional some number of years ago, would say of thanksgiving of wor and worship unto God, exactly what I would say of it. That it is, it is the most necessary reality of a Christian that we worship him. He says a spirit of thankfulness is one of the most distinctive marks of a Christian whose heart is attuned to the Lord. Thank God in the midst of trials and every persecution. The most necessary, the most fundamental and elementary principle of Christian living is worship. It is praise. It is giving God thanks. It is 
coming to the point in your life that you stop looking in the mirror and start looking up. You stop looking at yourself and saying how great I am. And you start looking at God and saying how great God is. In 1 John chapter 4, verse 8, we are told that if we have not love, we have not God. If we do not love God and love his people, that he is saved alongside us, then we do not have God. Do you love God? Do you praise him? And in verse 2, we're given the reason that we are called to worship God. The psalmist doesn't just say worship God. He says worship God, verse 2, for because of this, if you needed some reasons to worship God this morning, let the psalmist give you some. For his loving kindness is great toward us. And the truth of the Lord is everlasting. Praise the Lord. We see in verse 2 the excellencies of God's character. If we are honest with ourselves and with each other, our heart is sometimes burdened beyond worship. We are sometimes downcast of soul. And that makes worship and thankfulness a difficult thing. How are we to worship when the bills are stacking up? How are we to be thankful when the cancer is spreading throughout the body? How are we to, to emit praise to God when it feels like those who don't even know Him, who don't even love Him, have a better life than we do? How are we to worship God in the midst of trials and persecutions? The simple answer that I would give you, and the answer that we all have to work through in the days of the life ahead of us, is to stop looking for reasons to worship Him in this world, and instead just to look to Him. Stop trying to make your situation a little bit better than what you think it is. And for that, for, for your good situations, for the good circumstances, you'll praise him. Praise him for who he is. Worship him because of what he's done. It says here in verse 2, for his loving kindness is great toward us. The Hebrew word that's used here is has said. It is the first of two reasons that we are called to worship God. And it is because his love his love, its greatness and its gift, his, his love. The Hebrew word has said means mercy or love or, or uh, loving kindness or goodness toward us. We're told in Exodus 34 verses 6 through 7 that our God, our King is known by love. He is known by giving us what no other can, mercy. Mercy is the pardon of sin when punishment of sin is deserved. It is taking away what we deserve and giving us what we don't deserve. And God here is said to be merciful. He is merciful. And we're told in Lamentations chapter 3 that His mercies renew every day. They're fresh to us every morning. I think about how many sins I committed just last night. Because of those, I'm deserving of death, but I'm covered by the blood of Christ. And therefore, I have reason to give him thanks because I woke up this morning. I didn't wake up in hell this morning. I woke up and I came here and I was able to gather with you and to preach this word, even despite of my absolute unworthiness to do it. And that is reason to give him praise. If you have breath in your lungs and Christ in your heart, it is because of God's work. It is because of God's mercy. It is because of God's love. So praise him for it. And notice, notice here, it says, for his loving kindness, his love, his mercy is great toward us. It is not dependent upon how good we are. It is not uh, good. It is not uh, fairly decent. It is great. It is powerful. It is mighty. It is able to break the chains of sin. The mercy of God is great, and it's great toward us. It's great toward each individual whom God has called into his midst. That he is being gracious to you even now. We're told in Romans chapter 5, verses 6 through 8, if you want to turn with me there very quickly. Romans chapter 5, verses 6 through 8. For while we, will, we were still helpless, at the right time, Christ died 
for the ungodly. For one will hardly die for a righteous man, though perhaps for the good man someone would dare even to die. But God, but God, demonstrates his own love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Christ died for us. I want us to think about that for a moment. Truly consider what God has done for you. Think about where he's brought you from. Think about all the sins that you had committed. All of the evil that was in your heart. And God saved you from it all if you're in Christ. He loves you in spite of it all because of Christ's work for you. God sent his only son to live the life of perfect obedience that you and I could not live, to die the death that we deserved in order that we might die out to death with him and rise to newness of life with him as he rose from the grave three days later. He is living and reigning as the triumphant king in heaven. And he has done that for us. What mercy is that? What kindness is that? What love is that? That God would do that for us because of his love and secondly lastly we see that we are to worship God because of his leadership his leadership it says in verse 2 in the truth of the Lord is everlasting there's so much in today's media so much in today's society Much of what today's culture accepts as right and true, all of it is lies. They spew lies and they get mad at people for not believing their lies. But we never have to worry about the Lord being a liar. We're told in Numbers 23, 19 that he is not a man that he should lie. We're told in Titus 1, verse 2 that he cannot lie because it is not in his nature. And here we're told in Psalm 117, verse 2, that the truth of the Lord is everlasting. It will never fade. We're told in Psalm 12 and in Isaiah chapter 40 that the truth of the Lord will remain forever. If you need something to anchor your soul to this morning, if you feel so hopeless and helpless this morning, anchor your soul to the leadership of God, trusting that he is a truthful leader, that he is a God who governs with truth, that he does not manipulate with lies. He does not trick us. He gives us the truth. And the truth is of our nature that we are dead in our trespasses and sins, and yet he has sent his son to die for us, to save us. And the truth once we are saved in him is Romans chapter 8, verse 1. There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ. And if you are in Christ, beloved, worship him for it. The truth of the Lord is everlasting. God is never at risk of causing doubt because of himself. He is never to be held responsible for our faithlessness to him. It is no part of his doing that should cause us to fear that he is trustworthy. All of our fears, all of our doubts, all of our failures to trust in God's word are not issues with his word. They are issues with the world. Let me say that again. All of our fears and doubts regarding God's word are not due to some failure in his word. They're due to our failure to believe them. So I would urge you this morning, trust in the Lord. Trust in the Lord because his truth is everlasting. His truth does not wax and wane as the truths of today. His truth is never changing, never failing, never ending. His truth exists forever because it is written down as with an iron pen in heaven. And because of that, look at the very last clause. This is, the the psalmist put bookends here. At the beginning of verse 1, praise the Lord. And at the end of verse 2, praise the Lord. All of your life from the beginning to the end should have these bookends. Praise the Lord. We are called to worship him to lift up praise to him because of who he is and what he has done. He is truthful. He is good. He is gracious. 
and he is everlasting. So as we come to a close, I want to ask you again a personal question. Are you thankful to God? Yes. Not only for what he gives you. I don't just mean for all the material blessings that he's given you. Are you, are you thankful to God? Are you thankful for who he is? For what he's done in Christ for you? I pray that you are. I plead with you that you would be. And if you're not, if you're not thankful to God, if you take the things of God for granted, I plead with you, I beg with you, that you would repent. Look to him. Trust in him. If your soul is longing for more, all that your soul longs for is found in Christ. Run to him and he will give you rest. Let's pray. Father, I thank you again for your word. It has been preached for 2,000 years, and yet it is not out-preached or over-preached because the gospel is the power into salvation. And Father, we know that you have sent your son to die for his people. And if we are in Christ, then we are one of yours. And what a wonderful truth that is. What a blessing it is to be known as a child of God. That we are not known by our sin anymore, but that we are known if we are in Christ by your salvation that you have given to us. Oh God, we thank you for that. And when, not if, but when our hearts become beaten down by the things of this world, when it becomes difficult to worship, Help us, Lord, not to look to the things of this world to cause us to worship you, but to look to you, to look to you, to trust in you for who you are and what you do and the promises that you have made of the things that you will do. Help us to trust in you because, Father, we know that you are worthy of it. Help us, Lord. We ask that by the power of your Spirit, you would work this word into our lives. And we pray this in Christ's name. Amen.